Hi there, I'm Jim Zirand. Welcome back to more Conversations in the Digital Age. Today we have a terrific show for you, and I really wish our guests were interviewing me rather than the other way around. <laughs> With us is a true star of television, the journalist Deborah Norville. Born in Dalton, Georgia, the carpet capital of the world, she began as a beauty contest winner, got into TV journalism in Chicago, and became an anchor and correspondent for CBS News after being co-host and anchor of Today on NBC. She's the best-selling author of Thank You, Power, about making the science of gratitude work for you. Deborah is now the anchor of Inside Edition, a daily TV news magazine, which has enjoyed a 27-year run featuring a mix of hard news stories, entertainment news and gossip scandals, true crime stories and lifestyle features. And she is one of the independent directors of the embattled media giant Viacom. We will talk about the role of the media in the current presidential campaign. Deborah, we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you, Jim. It's fun to be here. Now, the media has been uh, faulted for creating Donald Trump, promoting Donald Trump, trashing Donald Trump. Uh, which is right. Do they have much to answer for in this presidential campaign? The media always has much to answer mm -hmm. for in every presidential campaign. Um, but certainly in this particular presidential campaign, when the other candidates, I think it was John Kasich the other day, uh, complained that uh, the media had given Donald Trump probably $2 billion worth of free media attention. I don't know if the figure is right, but certainly the, the inference is correct. Trump got an unbelievable amount of attention during what uh, a recent uh, report at Harvard calls the invisible primary. And that's that period of time before any of us have a chance to go into an election booth and actually cast a vote. It's that period in the summer months leading up to the fall. And then, so Donald Trump declared his candidacy, I think, in early June, almost exactly one year ago. Beginning then, he was the shiny new toy. We'd seen Jeb a million times. We knew all about Ted Cruz. He did the filibuster. John Kasich, he's been around Ohio forever. But Donald Trump stepped in here and it's like, the guy from Apprentice, the billionaire, um, the man who puts gold all over everything, he wants to be president? Hardy har har, what a funny joke. But because it was different, it was interesting, and he was um, unexamined material he was irresistible to the press. Well, he started at 1% in the polls, and uh, but he, boy, did he, as you've said, did he make good copy. Yeah, he made and good copy, and he skyrocketed in the polls because of the media attention he was getting, not necessarily because of any policy statements he was making. He wasn't making any policy statements other than to rile up people um, about immigration and walls and lovely doors in those walls. But there wasn't any real policy that was being uttered by Mr. Trump. Well, he said to the Republican establishment what he used to say on The Apprentice, you're fired. And, he did. And he attacked uh, the uh, icons of the Republican Party, the Bushes and uh, John McCain. And um, I mean, he had some outliers like Sarah Palin. But largely, he created a tremendous amount of attention by saying things that no presidential candidate has ever said. But what he said were things that the electorate, the common man, had been saying and thinking for a very long time. Um, it is a brilliant tagline that he has created, make America great again. Who can argue with the idea that America should be a great country? And if you believe that America has slipped, and many polls indicate that many Americans do, then a slogan, make America great again, is one that anybody can embrace because no one is going to embrace the antithesis of that. Let's make America suck. That's not gonna happen. So Trump was, Trump is a brilliant marketer. Does he know anything about governing? He has no experience in that area. Well, you have reality TV and uh, people have said about reality TV is that it's uninformative but very entertaining. And uh, Ted Koppel said it marks uh, the end of civilization. Um, well, I think the end of civilization <laughs> has been marked many times. Yes. Um, wasn't it 12-20-12 um, or something? Mm -hmm. Nostradamus said we were all going to go, or the, the Mayans had predicted that it was going to be the end times or something like that. Um, the end of civilization has been uh, feared many times. I don't think Mark Donald Twain, the reports of its demise have been exaggerated. Yeah, well, I thought that was a, reports of my demise have been greatly <laughs> exaggerated. Um, no, I don't think Donald Trump is going to be the end of civilization unless you are an establishment politician, in which case civilization, as you've known it in your world, 
very well may be ending. I mean, what we see across the board, we have two candidates who are the presumptive nominees mm -hmm. in Secretary Clinton and Donald Trump. We have two candidates, neither of whom have very high likability ratings. On the contrary, it's a race to see who is more disliked on both sides of the electoral race aisle. Race to the bottom. It's a race to the bottom. Uh, now, Les Moonves, who is the CEO, as you know, of the CBS, uh, said, uh, it's a terrible thing to say, but bring it on, Donald. Keep going. He likes the ad money and he likes sure the he fun does. of sure the Trump does. campaign. Every television um, station group owner, and CBS has over 30-something percent, as does NBC, ABC, um, Nexstar, which is um, run by Perry Sook. There are a bunch of TV groups, Tribune. They're all going to do quite well, thank you very much, because of the ad money that will come in. If Mr. Trump has money to spend. That's his biggest challenge. He hasn't really been raising money. You know, he said his campaign was going to be self-funded, but we know he needs close to a billion dollars to really mount an effective national campaign. How much is the Republican National Committee going to be able to assist in that regard? Because we've also heard a number of prominent Republicans have said, you know, mm. I'll wait this one out for a little bit. I'll see what I'm going to do. Well, was it illegitimate of Trump to have courted the press the way he did? I mean, he always made himself available for interviews. If there was a TV program like this one, he'd call in. Sure. Uh, and uh, he would get on and uh, he would make some outrageous statement, either uh, trashing Muslims or women or uh, uh, Mexicans or somebody. And uh, he began to rise in the polls. I wouldn't say the word is illegitimate. I would say it was strategically um, brilliant. Because when he would say these outlandish things and pick whatever group he attacked, and pretty much everybody has been on the receiving end. I don't know if he's done, you know, nice men who do um, interview shows uh, in New York, but you'll be next if he hasn't gotten you yet. Um, every time he called in and said something outrageous, the rest of the media reported it. And it's like throwing a stone in a pond. If this tabletop were a pond and we throw a rock right here, it's going to ripple out. And the coverage ripples out and goes further and further and further. And you might not have heard about Donald Trump, but you'll hear about him because of that story. And you might not like what he just said, but you're curious about the kind of person that would say that in public discourse. And he's almost like an itch. You know, you get a little mosquito bite. You don't have to scratch it, but you scratch it once, and then it's like you want to scratch it again. Donald Trump is like that. You pay a little bit of attention. He said, what? And then you pay, he said, what? And then you go, oh, wait a minute. That, he be that I believe. That I agree with. So he says enough outrageous things about enough different groups. Everybody has biases. He will probably say something that you agree with. Uh, you might not want to admit it, but you might find some, some area of common ground with him. And that has absolutely augured his, um, his growth in the polls. Well, uh, not only in the polls, uh, he uh, garnered uh, almost 13 million primary voters. More than uh, any other Republican nominee. In history. Yeah. Of course, he had more uh, people voted against him uh, than anyone else in, in, That's in, probably in true, the Republican yeah. primary. Uh, Hillary got, by contrast, got 16 million votes, uh, which is fewer than the 17.5 million she got against Obama in, in 2008. But she also had competition much longer um, than in 2008. You know what I mean? Um, Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders still has not ended his presidential campaign. Presumably he likes having the Secret Service to keep him company. Um, but he still hasn't ended it. And so he's having a good time. He's having a great time, you and know. It's the class that never graduates. But uh, yeah. the, uh, well, what about Bernie Sanders? Was the, were the media fair to Bernie Sanders? At first, they dismissed him completely as a... And a, then did they give him too much attention when it was clear he didn't have a snowball's chance in hell of, of yeah. getting the nomination? Um, again, he was the Larry David of politics. He said these crazy things that... And maybe he took a page out of the Trump playbook. Um, because it certainly worked for Donald Trump. Did Bernie Sanders say increasingly crazy things on the campaign or the fact that he didn't say, 
I step aside, I will support the nominee, I hope to influence the platform at the convention, which is what typical candidates do. Did he say, I will be an atypical candidate because it's worked so well for, for Donald Trump? But he basically attached, uh, attacked three issues, didn't he? He attacked the issue of income inequality, yeah. which is uh, certainly fair to which attack in this Absolutely. country. Uh, and uh, he talked about student loans, which are exorbitant, and he talked about political corruption. And uh, the, uh, since Citizens United, the millions and billions of dollars that have gone into super PACs uh, and influenced campaigns. Right. And that resonated with, particularly with young people. They said, what chance do I have in a system that's rigged this way? Yeah, and in a way, it dovetails with what Donald Trump's message has been, because both of them, if you want to kind of get more general about it, it's about fairness. Do I feel that the system is fair to me? If I'm a student and I'm graduating with $120,000 and the average student loan debt that people graduate with is somewhere around thirty dollars to $40,000, if you're a student graduating with that much debt, do you feel like it's going to be fair going forward? Um, it's if almost you're, impossible to pay off. It's, a, it's like those, those young people will not take risks and America's greatness has been based, in my opinion, on people being willing to just roll the dice and see what happens, leap out there and invent a company, start a new business, um, take this crazy idea and play around in your garage, and the next thing you know, you've built a computer. You can do that if you don't have to essentially have a wife and two kids hanging over you. But that's what graduating with that amount of student debt is. It's like having a wife and two kids. you got to play it safe you got to take the, the secure job. And so what's the future for those con kids going to be? It's going to be tough. And, and so that message resonates. Income inequality, there is something fundamentally wrong when there is a gap this big between the super-haves and the never-haves. That's not American. So that message resonates. And that's clearly an issue for whoever gets elected president. Now, does Bernie Sanders have the right solution for it? Um, sort of the Robin Hood approach? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Um, based on the number of votes that he got, but it certainly resonated with people. That he was talking about the issue mattered, and I think it will be influential going forward. Right? Let's just turn to uh, the attitude of uh, the media, because having uh, allegedly created Donald Trump or helped Donald Trump create himself, uh, now they appear to be savaging Donald Trump. That is and the role that, of the press. We the, build them up and we tear them tear down. Tear them right down. Yeah. So, uh, and we do it every four years. Now, he sort of helped himself in, uh, in the destruction because uh, here you had a, a sort of a, a week where the inspector general of the State Department uh, came out with a report about Hillary's emails. Mm -hmm. And Trump, you would think, would have tried to capitalize on that. Instead, out of the blue, he talks about a civil case that's pending against him in San Diego and where uh, the judge has actually made several rulings in his favor. His own, the Trump's own lawyers uh, said it was fair. He hasn't moved to disqualify the judge in the case, but he comes out publicly and says the judge is a Mexican, which he's not, and attacks the judge and says uh, that he's biased against him. He's as much a Mexican as Donald Trump is a German. Yes. Okay? It's just crazy. Um, I can't make sense of it. What do you think, Jim? Well, I mean, why would he have done that? Because it's, it seemed like shooting himself in the foot. Incomprehensible, except this drum roll against the Mexicans. Uh, and, you know, Mexican immigration is way down now. And uh, it, uh, that's not really the issue. When you talk about immigration, people are afraid of uh, ISIS. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and um, they're afraid of Al Qaeda. And also and, the question, what do we do with the estimated 11 million undocumented individuals who are here right now? Um, do you send them back to their home country? Do you find a way to allow them to earn their, their citizenship? Uh, many of them have been here for decades. It just seems like that's, that's an unsolved question that someone is going to have to address. Well, and and they many have, have tried, including Marco and, Rubio. And they have children who are born here in the United States Correct. and are therefore citizens. Correct. Now, how do you deport citizens because their parents are here illegally? Correct, yeah. Obama... Uh, took it on himself to say, I'm not going to deport uh, Mexicans or others uh, who are here illegally, who have uh, a work history in the United States and have uh, parents of children. But he didn't go the step further, which was to say how we can 
what what system can be put in place if he's not going to deport them? Need, how can you get them on the books? Needed, how can you make needed them? Congress for that? Yeah. but he wasn't going to involve. Well, he hasn't exactly worked really well yeah, with well, Congress. Well, that's right. Or at but, all. And the Supreme Court will have to tell us whether he did that right. uh, uh, that legally. But but to the Trump thing, I think I think the 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 question you raise about why out of the blue would he have attacked. Um, the judge in the Trump University case, which only draws attention to this case of federal fraud that's being alleged. Certainly, if you're running for the highest office in the land, you don't want to draw attention to the fact that people think you're a fraudster, at least those people down in, in um, the San Diego district do. It raises the question of stability in the Oval Office. Um, if you're on this path, to see him take a, a veer in, in another direction causes concern for some people. And that, that will be a legitimate area of inquiry for the media. I think, I think anything is fair game if one can make a legitimate case that this has bearing on the way you would conduct yourself in the Oval Office. And there are questions to be asked about Hillary Clinton as well. Um, the email questions are very real and very serious. and and, and Trump, Clinton Foundation questions are the very Clinton serious. Foundation questions are hugely serious are, are is is secretary Clinton um, of of a mind that she can make her own rules and play by them and it's okay because we've been in the White House before um, can Donald Trump suddenly go off in this crazy direction because he wants to and it gets good copy or it makes copy whether it's good or bad. Those are real questions and, and people want answers to them and they want the press, they depend upon the press to try to look at it from six different angles and come up with some clarity. And maybe you can't, but we do have to do the examination. Let's uh, move on to the tragedy in Orlando. Uh, Trump was quick to accept congratulations uh, for saying I told you so. Uh, that if we don't uh, exclude Muslims from this country, they're going to be uh, tragedies like this. Yeah, never mind uh, that this gentleman was born in the United States. Born in Queens, the same borough where Trump was born. And uh, he uh, uh, was quick to say he was an Afghan. Now, uh, you uh, who I would worked say in he's carpets, a New Yorker. you think of Afghans as rugs, but uh, the... Uh, he uh, uh, was not an Afghan, or I guess we said an Afghani. He, Afghani, right. And his father was an Afghani. And uh, so, uh, again, it seemed to be a misstep of Trump's own making. But do you think uh, this has been overblown in the press in order to try to attack Trump as, uh, as a racist or as uh, uh, a pro-gun madman? Um, I, think that, I think that Donald Trump based on the totality of his statements. I don't think, I don't think it's so much being a racist, uh, maybe a xenophobe. Um, he has clearly multiple times made statements that indicate he is not a fan of anyone coming to this country unless they look like him. And, uh, and that resonates with a lot of people. I think, um, look, the economy is only okay. The economy is not great. Here we are eight years after the economic collapse, and while allegedly we're back to full employment at around 5%, the truth is that number doesn't include those people who have simply given up. Well, Trump and, says it's 42%. Well, so, I'm not sure uh, that that number, I'd love know. to see where he gets that particular figure right. from, but he'll never share that information. So I, I, no one else has been able to replicate that figure. Um, I think many people say it's probably closer to around 20 percent when you add in the disaffected um, people who've given up looking for jobs. People are concerned about their retirement. We're all living longer. Um, the average retirement savings in this country is less than $50,000. You don't get very far um, for many years if you have less than $50,000. So there's a lot of real concern about what my financial future is going to be amongst many demographics. And so when Trump speaks about immigration and people coming in, it can resonate with those people who are fearful of their financial future because they don't have the job security, the financial security uh, for their futures that they would like. They're worried about how their kids are going to be educated. College tuition is going up double, 
triple the rate of inflation. What is inflation, about 2% or something like that? Very it's low. It's like 10% a year. It's ridiculous. No. So there are a lot of reasons for people to be concerned. And what they're hoping to see from Washington is someone, anyone, who's going to have some answers. The one thing Donald Trump does have is sort of like this, this energy, this can-do. Um, but is it a, a, what is it, Potemkin Village? We don't know. But the answers are often uh, false answers. Correct. Because according to the, the New York Times. And the village wasn't a real village that's on, the, a, on the Volga, was it? That's right. The, the New York Times and the Washington Post say that he's lied 70% uh, of the time. Uh, Hillary's only lied 28% of the time. And we're supposed uh, to feel good about uh, either one of these? Uh, either one of them. The uh, Paris uh, Climate Accord, he said, gives foreign bureaucrats control over how much energy we use on our land. That's false. He said there was no drought in California. That's yeah. false. People cheering in New Jersey as the Twin didn't Towers happen. went down, didn't happen. Uh, and uh, I never said uh, Japan should have nukes, he said, but he did say that. Uh, and uh, has the press been efficient in uh, catching these lies in real time? I mean, shouldn't you have something on the television screen that every time he makes an outrageous statement, uh, this sort of a, a, a zip, the a light zipper starts or a banner going, yeah. and, and, and say tilt? Uh, exactly. What do you think? I think that there are some members of the press that have been incredibly energetic about that. The fact that you just were able to recite all of these um, falsehoods means that someone reported it and you found it in your research, so it's out there. Um, but is it getting as widely disseminated? And I think that's kind of the crux of what's created this crazy election that we've got. Those fact-checking stories are kind of dry and sort of boring. And you're kind of like, okay, fine, yeah, so he lied. But he says something inflammatory. The Mexican judge and the way he says it, it's impossible for the press, all of the press, not to cover that. But it's not as zazzy to say he lied about this and this and this and this. But which is more important? The less zazzy is usually the more important. It's like, you know, taking your you know, eating your vegetables or whatever. You might not like the vegetables, but you need them. Well, um, Donald Trump is like French fries in a milkshake, right? And you'd rather you have can, French fries in a milkshake. You, you really can want binge to, on it. You can binge and, and on it. And get into trouble. Yeah, you get a real bad tummy ache if you're not careful. Has the media been fair to the respective candidates? I mean, Trump gets on CNN, MSNBC, on Fox News, many more mentions than Hillary yeah. Clinton. I mean, he's, uh, they feel he's fun to follow, fun to watch. Sure. And whether he tells the truth or he lies, whether it's inflammatory or not, whether he's politically uh, off the charts, uh, but uh, they cover him. And you're right, and I think the, the balance of the coverage was completely out of whack. Um, but here's the thing. First of all, cable broadcasting, cable television is not governed by the FCC, uh, whereas broadcast television is. However, with the Telecom Act of 1996, the Fairness Doctrine disappeared. That notion that there should be generally equitable time given to the respective candidates disappeared. Because the wisdom of the FCC, the wisdom of Congress in passing this act was, you now have a multiplicity of information sources and therefore you do not need to hold the broadcast outlets to a certain standard when there are all these other people in this new wild, wild west of telecom who don't have those same strictures. The end result, however, was in some cases nobody got coverage and someone like a Donald Trump got the lion's share of it. Deborah, what will the debates look like? I mean, what happens if uh, Deborah Norville asks uh, the candidates, uh, you know, what's your approach to Syria? What should we do about Syria? And uh, Hillary comes up with some bland policy statement, mm -hmm. uh, which she's on record as having said. Right. And then Trump said, uh, Syria's not the issue in this Bomb campaign. Bomb them into the Stone Age. Or, or and we don't have to talk about Syria. The issue here is trust. You can't believe her. She's crooked Hillary, or Monica Lewinsky, the foundation. Oh, okay, so she doesn't uh, bother to that, answer the question. Doesn't even bother to answer the question, you which is a typical him. Trump response. Now, uh, uh, is the media gonna hold uh, his feet to the fire, or are they going to just allow him to? Uh, uh, I think go it depends who's way. sitting there, you yeah. know, on the on the desk asking the questions. I mean, we've seen um, the great thing about the debates this year 
we've seen record numbers of people watching these debates. The first Republican debate had almost 24 million people. The first Democratic debate that CNN had, I think, said 17 million people. That's astonishing. And that was for a contest that wasn't nearly as entertaining um, from a sheer entertainment uh, perspective as the Republicans. People are interested. People care. And that's why they're watching. And they're trying to be, this is the other thing, I think, they want to be their own news editor. The great thing about a debate is it is me, the viewer, listening to what the candidate has to say without the filter of the media. And I can judge for myself if this person is prevaricating, if they're ignoring the question, if, hmm, that makes a lot of sense. I think I like that approach. We have the opportunity without it being prefaced by someone's, and in a snarky remark, Trump said, well, that's already colored the way you're going to to, to hear what the soundbite is. Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. It's no! been absolutely wonderful. You have, you know, it goes so quickly when you're having a good time. It but does. I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Uh, will the media influence the outcome of the presidential race? It always does. Always does. Deborah Norville, thank you thank so you, much Jim. for coming by. Well, and thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations in the digital age. I'm Jim Zirin. All the best.